Good morning. Good morning. Here we're looking at the first part of March, and of course, those of you that are watching us in replay on 989 will, as I always say, have a better idea of what's going on, but uh, we're looking at some melting conditions here around the area, and <laughs> the roads are like washboards again. It mm -hmm. happens every year as the frost begins to come out, and I would imagine there is a usual plethora of complaints from time to time about what are you going to do about that? Oh, yeah. there. I mean, it, it's very interesting. There's always an issue with the roads. Um, you know, their frost it takes its toll. And then as the snow, you see it going up and down central over towards the edges, that uh, the, the moisture and the dirt and what that's collective there. And then what will happen is we'll get a big rain and that'll become an issue. So um, we're always doing something with roads. And uh, we're just going to have to wait and see how everything plays out. I'm hopeful with your great... Uh, forecast for the weekend up at the 50s and i think i just heard you guarantee that we will not go below that for the rest of the year which very i'm very happy you did that no, the rest of the night no, the, 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 the rest of the night yeah <laughs> selective hearing right <laughs> um but uh hopefully everything will continue to get better and better you know as i travel around in this part of the state marshfield we get a lot of complaints always but it's not bad I mean, I've, some of the other cities have just as big or worse problems than what we have here. But, of course, because you're traversing them on a daily basis, you'd wish things were better. Now, Central Avenue got redone, and that's miles ahead, if you will, of where it was. So, Yeah, you know, what's interesting is you um, – it's interesting the perspective, how I look at things now in the role that I'm in as opposed to before when I wasn't in the role. Um, which you brought up in the in the, b before the first election, you know how do things change once you actually get in? And one thing I do, I am very sensitive about and look at is as I go to other cities, I evaluate those roads. And you know we, uh, you know there are certainly some roads that need help here, um, and we're getting to those. Um, but overall, they're actually pretty good. Boy, especially when you. You've been down to, to uh, Milwaukee and, and other places like that. I mean, those roads are rough. And um, so you just look at things, I think, a little bit differently. You know, you look at economic development. You look at what other cities are doing. And there's a whole different uh, set of things that you look at. But roads, I, I think it really helped the perception of our roads in, uh, in Marshfield because Central was so bad. Um, that one stretch from Arnold to Harrison, I mean, that was horrible before with all the big pothole, I mean, huge potholes. Um, if you see some of the memes on Facebook that they have, they have a guy fishing in a pothole and things like that. It sure felt like that. And, but you could see if, if you're way, way back towards Harrison, you could see, people, you know, serpentining to the left and to the right, avoiding them. So I think now that that it's done and it looks good and it seems to hold up well, um, I, I think it's going to be good. You know, the State Department of Transportation are hopeful that we get 10 to 12 years out of it, which means 20 years um, when, you, <laughs> when you look at the excuses. Um, because the the under the substructure is 100 years old, so it really needs to be a complete reconstruct. So we're hoping that th this is going to hold up well. Talking with uh, Mayor Bob McManus here on this first Friday in March. You can too if you're listening live on WDLB 384-2191, 384-2191. We'll be talking about the business of the city here. And uh, also, uh, whatever else comes around that, uh, you know, making comparisons sometimes to other places because you get, and it's natural, into the business of what's happening here. And you think, well, how are we going to do that? And sometimes you look at other people and go, oh, that's how they did it. It may or may not work. But, you know, finding or trying to find your own way uh, through the world here without having a knowledge of what's going on around you sometimes People get a little bit over immersed and get excited about how we're going to do this. And a lot of people are, su I wouldn't say, I don't want to use the word suffering, but experiencing a lot of the same issues that we're having here from construction to whatever brings uh, spring and frost and 
pavement and plowing and all those things and parks and all the things that we talk about that the city offers. And I see construction going on around here, which some people think is maybe unnecessary. And other times I think to myself, well, it proves we're a viable uh, community of things going on, public and private entity things that are happening in our area. So we have a f good tax base, not out of the ordinary from the facts of what we're looking at around the area. And we seem to have, and you've been a good cheerleader for the community, um, but there is a real feel here that has been created and it is palpable that things are going pretty well here at the present time. Yeah, it's, uh, and I will tell you, there are some very exciting things that are going to be coming down in the next 30 to 60 days. They're going to be very exciting. You know, one thing that's happening, yesterday I went to a ribbon cutting at the uh, Chestnut Center for the Arts. They just had a, a new um, chairlift put in, which is, and that place is beautiful. Pizza Ranch is doing a soft opening, um, you know, next week. It's been very interesting that... The Hampton Inn, uh, those folks have been out there. I mean, even when it was two or three below, they were out there working. So they're working to get that uh, put in. There's some very good things coming to the Planning Commission that um, are just, you know, we don't even know who the players are or what they're going to construct, if you will. But there's a lot of very interesting things coming in there you know it's it's very interesting that you that um i think what happens is sometimes certainly what i've seen is cities or areas can get tunnel visioned into certain things and this is we want this but this is the way we've always had it that's that's the biggest issue um and i just traveled to i was out in california last week visiting my older kids and my grandson and I took four or five hundred pictures I'll show you later of uh, me and my grandson and what was interesting is the development that's going on in these cities was really incredible and going through Minneapolis there you know there's a lot of development on it and we have that fair amount here but I think certain cities or areas are really trying to develop and there are others that are maybe a little bit more skeptical. The, the times these days are, are very good. I just heard when you were doing your, uh, your lead-in, the news before, I think it was 278,000 jobs, new jobs. And, of course, that's prior to the coronavirus. Who knows what's gonna, what is going to happen with there. So, overall, I think people are opt cautiously optimistic because it, it never lasts forever. You have to be, I, I believe in your growth. It has to be, um, it can't be hype growth. And it can't be everybody jump on the on the bandwagon. It's got to be, uh, it's got to be controlled. I just met the other day with uh, Steve Barg, the city administrator, and and um, uh, our, our finance director, and Tom Witzel, who's the president of the uh, council. And we went through each TIF that we have, each TIF that's in the in the TID. We went through each one. They are performing so well. Had they been managed financially correctly over the prior 8 to 10, 12 years or whatever, oh, my gosh, we would be in just such a uh, different place than we are right now. But the way they are, and we're looking at, at these TIDs and TIFs closing seven, eight, nine years early. Um, and so that's very optimistic. That's going to help us down the road for sure. But it also shows that when the council and the former mayor and the council and the, the, the city folks were looking at, at transactions to develop, that they really did a good job. And they really did... Um, they were very careful in making sure that those developments were going to pencil out properly long term. So when I commend them uh, for that, because our our TIF districts are all pretty strong, we have a couple that are a little bit um, 
lagging a little bit. But the, what we make and the other ones that were called donor tids uh, make up for it. So now we just have to look at what the citizens of Marshfield want. And it's very interesting. You know, you look at the, the pool. Fundraising has gone quite well. Um, we're very optimistic to get some news in the next couple of days um, that would continue that good momentum. But you look at a couple of the different variables. You know, there's some people that go, there are some people that have concern about it, like, why do you do that when it's only four months out of the year? And that is one argument. It's a good argument. Um, and, of course, the 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 answer that the committee that did this came up with back in 16 and 17 was people want to be outside. Um, you, one thing was very different is when I was out in California, people in normal neighborhoods aren't out walking around and, and doing things like that. Well, here, you know, when you, I mean, I guarantee you this weekend, 50 degrees, all the neighborhoods, people are going to be out walking. And it's like, we celebrate that. Um, and so people want to be outside. And if they wanted to go inside, they can go over to the Y or to the high school. They've got great facilities there, but people want to be outside. Um, an argument that some, another argument that people had was why not build it indoors? You know, have this huge uh, indoor facility. Now, if you look at the cost of doing that, having an indoor water park, you're way above the six million or six and a half million dollar threshold that we're at. You're looking at doubling that, and uh, we just don't have the the uh, the financing available for that. Then we, I something like that. You'd probably be looking at double, maybe triple the cost. So um, uh, we're very optimistic about the pool. Looks like it's going to go well, and we certainly hear. The um, and appreciate the different dialogue that's going on. We hear that on everything. When a new business opens up, there are some that are, if, if, if you've watched on social media how the pizza ranch is going about, they're really building up some momentum and they've got a good social media presence and, and they're, people are excited about that opening up. In the very beginning, there were people concerned, why do we need another pizza place and Stuff like that. It's like, well, when a business owner wants to come to town and open up a business, as long as they're opening up a legal business, then they can open up. I mean, that question goes to that owner. I think some people have a misconception that um, the city goes out and gets these businesses and brings them in, and that's that's not the case. Josh Miller, uh, who is our development services director, you know, he, he certainly facilitates people when they want to come. Mackie does a tremendous job of getting uh, people here. But the more amenities we have, like the great new facility, the, the, uh, the football facility over at the high school, the pool, the zoo, those all make things more attractive. So when people come here, eh, they want to come back. And they want to move here. And, and attract people that have other – because, as you said, one of the things that d you don't want to miss here is that when you left, even for vacation, you look around and you go, I see what other people – now you know what you're up against uh, when you're seeing someone come in. When, you've, when you're in your house, you don't see how it looks. Other people have a comparison. You know, you don't. Right. So you need to get out once in a while and see how things are going in other parts of the community other than just reading literature. And you've succinctly described here why, when we hear about the good economy, people say, well, what does that have to do with me? My wages didn't go up. I didn't get anything, you know. Well, as a whole, things are moving and being done. And even though you may not, jobs are being held rather than, you know, layoffs and construction are natural in this part of the country. In the wintertime, things slow down. But there's some being done. There's new projects on the way. Those kind of things are being done because people have faith in this economy as a whole, as a big picture. So and the things that we're doing as a city that you mentioned are because of the good economy, are because of there's faith that this is going to improve and it's going to make an improvement in what's happening. 
It's yeah, oh, 100%. I go, you talk about roads. I lived in New Hampshire. They don't have state tax. Wow. Mm. <laughs> and they have frost and snow and plows, but man, their roads are terrible. Right. Just terrible. Just beat up potholes, shell, you know, scabbed off pavement. It's just awful. And, but well, they don't have any state tax. At the end of the year, I said, where's my state tax book? That They said, you're not from around here, are you? I right. said, uh, no. I said, we don't have that here. Wow. I said, well, that's handy, you know, for my pocketbook, but look at what you get. And when you go to other communities, like you said, look at the what you get for what... Wisconsin is, what, fifth in highest taxes. It's been a problem uh, we've talked about since I've been alive. As I'm a little boy, people were complaining about the tax rate. But when you go other places and people come here, they go, it's really nice here. But you don't see that because you're the one that's paying for it and living in it. You know what I'm saying? Right. So when you, you don't have that perspective. We'll talk more here about the business of the city with Mayor Bob McManus. You can, too, 384-2191, 384-2191 here on the Insight Program this first Friday in the month of March. Forward Bank has been helping homeowners purchase the home of their dreams since 1919. Hi, this is Angie Domini, mortgage lender for Forward Bank. This tradition of treating customers like family and helping build stronger neighborhoods is supported by a broad line of mortgage and home equity loans. Let us move the process of building, buying, or refinancing your home forward. To make the process easy, check out our online mortgage application at forward.bank or call us at 387-1122. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender, NMLS number 42293. Welcome to the Zaleski Sports Show. I'm your host, Jason Zaleski, and you can listen to the Zaleski Sports Show weekly right here on WDLB Mondays at 10 a.m. We'll recap the weekend football action from around the area, bring in local high school coaches to get their insight on the season. We'll also get you ready for the next week of volleyball, soccer, and back to football. It's the Zaleski Sports Show on WDLB Mondays at 10. WDLB's Insight Program on this first Friday in the month of March. You know that if you're listening live here on WDLB Radio, you could be watching us on video from Marshfield Media Access, uh, and you can see their website, or you can see us on Spectrum Cable Channel 989 uh, throughout the month as we visit with uh, Mayor Bob McManus here on this first Friday of the month. Um, he avails himself to your comments, questions, concerns, and just talking about the business of the city. We were talking about the perspective of uh, how you look at things and how we as citizens look at things compared to how things are in other places. And sometimes you don't get that perspective when you're here and you don't see what else is going on in other communities and why it's necessary to be a part of the world and to do some things other than just, I, mean, I think a lot of people would rather just sit on the pocketbook and say, no, we're not doing any of that stuff. And when you see what others are doing, you begin to understand why you have to step up your game a little bit to get here. We've had some, um, some job loss from a, a company and then again, we've had some come in uh, it, it, some come, some go, it seems like, uh, in this economy, as in any given time. But the city seems to be poised here with the new construction going on in the industrial park over there. Um, the old barn that was there is surrounded now. I went by there and went, what are they going to do with that? Are they going to take it down or are they build around it or what are they going to do with it? It's still undetermined. Okay. Still undetermined. But I will tell you in your in your bigger point that the uh, things are going well. You know, the, the population hasn't grown. I think last year was the first year it went up, I believe, by three to 400 folks. But if you look at it, we really don't have any new development. I mean, we're, we're building anywhere between 12 to 15 new homes a year within the city. But if you look at the groundswell of, I believe there's 120 new apartments coming online in the next month or two. Um, but there's three to 400 new apartments that are going to be available in the city. Some of them over there behind the high school, some of them over there behind Walmart that are going to be brand new. 
that's going to get more people here because we have a very unique situation that we've never really been able to figure out how to um, how to grasp. So many people come into Marshfield to work um, or come from an outlying areas. Maybe they're from Stratford. They'll come down to go to the supermarkets, Target. They'll come down to go shopping and whatnot. And they are not a necessarily part of the tax base. So the folks that are here have to foot the bill for everybody. And there's really no uh, way, you know, there was a, a talk a while ago of a gas tax. And it's like, well, you know, why why should the local people again have to, to foot the bill for that? How do we get that? Uh, which a, a gas tax could, or, you know, I, I believe they had a, a wheel tax. Um, but again, that's not going to help then the, the citizens here of Marshfield get hit with it again, not the people coming in. What we're learning is there's actually a lot of people going out to out of Marshfield for work as well. Um, and this is something that our businesses have. I mean, if you go talk to them, that's their biggest issue is getting people to to work. They don't there's not a big enough workforce, if you will, to to help our businesses grow. So of course then that gets to the fact of you've got to get more homes, you've got to get more housing so there's more people that live here then you've got a bigger employee base. Um, and of course if somebody's going to want to come live here then they're going to want to do things. You know one thing that I've heard certainly is um, in, in, uh, and I, I do watch social media and I watch it um, I've learned to watch it sparingly just because of the things. But there are some people that say there's nothing to do here in Marshfield. And realistically, I mean, if you see all the things going on every weekend, there are a lot of things to do. But people will say there's nothing in here to to do, but at the same time don't want to spend any money to develop or do things better. It's like, well, you, you can't realistically complain about both. You've either got to want to go, okay, let's put some money into this to getting other things maybe that you would like. Um, so it's a very interesting dynamic. The other thing that we're starting to see a little bit more of is more people actually engaging with city officials and, and people with the city, which is very nice. Um, and, and not just comments that are just online that, you know, somebody's up at 10 o'clock at night and just going through doing posts but but really good comments and and it's very interesting because the public has great ideas we're just looking for a way to get more of those and to get more on committees you know i have one of the things that the mayor does uh is appoints people to the committees and we have we have there's going to be new committee ap appointments coming up economic development board the, the historic preservation uh board um all different kinds of things and so we're looking for people to get engaged and bring their good ideas to the city. So if anybody listening has an interest in um, getting on a committee, you can call in and speak with Amy Krogman. Uh, she works with Steve and I, and uh, the phone number is 715-486-2002. Um, announcers always redo that again, so let me do that. So again, that phone number is... <laughs> 715-486-2002. And you can let her know if you have an interest on being on a committee because we are making those appointments. That'll be on uh, right after the election, the following meeting. Uh, all the, the new folks are appointed to those committees. The committees have anywhere from two to five-year terms. Uh, many of them meet once a month. Um, and But they do a lot for the city. I don't think people really know that a lot of work is done at that committee level. I mean, that's about as grassroots as you get. They do all the research for the projects, and they, I mean, we've got a lot of great people on, on the committees, and some of the people that we have are on multiple committees. So it would be really nice to get some diversity of thought to where people can really kind of hash it out and argue it out, if you will, at the committee level, so that then by the time it reaches the council, all the research has been done. So the committees then take it to the department heads and the department heads put it together the way it should and then it goes to council. 
Um, and, and we're hoping to get more input, more constructive input, if you will, from the, uh, from the public to help us guide where we're going to go. I don't know if the active engagement with government has come because of the rancor in the country th- th- at this time. But a lot of people thought that, you know, like writing your federal senator in a Senate district, you know, are they behold, at that level, are they beholden to the party or the people, you know? But when you get down, as you call it, the grassroots level here, when people talk, you listen. I mean, it, you may not do it that way. And there's that age old saying, yeah, they're going to do what they want to do anyway. Well, because when you weigh all sides and it's up to you to make a decision, it's not as simple as just doing what this guy wants and to heck with that guy. I mean, there's, you know, people to be considered on all sides of an issue that they may or may not understand. But there is a need for a voice. If I talk to my alderman, he's accessible. And and if I got more than one voice, that would be even better because, well, of course, they're worried about not only their... Uh, popularity, but also about doing the right thing. You know, is there an undertow here of something that's happening? But getting people to be on committees, give me an example of some of the things that people could get involved in that you need uh, people for. Oh, they can get on our communication uh, committee, which is great. And they have been doing phenomenal. Um, They've been doing a great job. There's historic preservation. There's economic development. There's just a whole plethora, if you will, of different committees. You can go to our website and you can see all the different committees. But the reason I like having um, more people on is certainly what I've learned. You know, when you come in as the new mayor or the new um, alder alder people, you come in with your eyes wide open and you really want to make them, you want to, you really want to do what's right. And you come in with good ideas. What you learn very quickly, what I hope people learn pretty quickly that are in our role is come in with a good idea, but be open to other ideas with it. And this is where the value of the community comes in. I'm sure that this happens to me a lot. I'm sure it's happened to you and anybody listening. Have you ever been looking at a piece of paper with something that you just cannot figure out? And you're looking at everything there. You just can't get it. And then somebody comes up from behind you and goes, oh, look, there it is right there. And it was right there in front of you. That's the value of somebody else's idea. Unfortunately, in the country, the way it's gone is, I don't know how to say this politically correct. Um, It's gone to playground antics, right? In other words, oh, you're you're not on my team. Psh, I don't want to hear your idea. That's crazy. It, it just it's silly. It's good to hear another person's idea, and maybe we have to put our guard down a little bit and let that other idea set in. You know, I learned this a long time ago, a hundred years ago, when I was in high school. Mister Har- Ron Harris, he was brilliant. We we had two debates uh, in a year. And for one week, you prepped for Monday through Thursday, you prepped for the debate. On Friday, you had the debate. And you, the first time you did this, you had to take the way you thought. In other words, your position on this topic. And you had to fight for that. And then on Friday, we had the big debate. Well, as you can imagine, that's when, okay, this is the way I feel. This is, this is my topic, right? So the debate got very big. What was very interesting is the following week, you had to take the other position and you had to research it the other way. And so those debates were really good because it forced everybody to open up their mind to maybe this could happen. And I believe that in, at the local level, I believe that we could still do that as you get further up into politics, as we're seeing, I just don't think that you, that there is that um, correlation of ideas. I don't know. That's not really the right term, but it just, if you're on my team, I'm going to agree with you. I don't care what it is. You're on my team. Here we go. That doesn't work at the local level. At the local level, that 
we have to do what's right for the team, and the team are the citizens of Marshfield, not us. We're supposed to represent what they want. We're supposed to have dialogue on what the citizens want. Now, of course, the only way we can have that dialogue is if the citizens give us that input. Otherwise, we really don't know. You know, we've had a couple of times where city staff will present something to us and the council will have a discussion based on the information that city staff has given. And that is the input. Um, and so we'll debate back and forth on that. Well, if nobody from the public has input it to their council members or city staff, then we're only going to go on that information. But I'll tell you this. There was a, uh, at 8th and Hemlock a year ago, there was an issue where the folks there at 8th and Hemlock were not happy. And the council was leaning towards going one way until about 28 people showed up at a council meeting and all of them individually took the stage to, to, to speak under, under public comment. And now that the council and everybody heard their perspective, yeah, the argument went completely the other way. And it was, yep, yeah, we're not doing this. Why? Because the public spoke. And so that's why when you hear people say that um, our opinion doesn't matter, they're going to do what they want, that couldn't be farther from the truth. But you have to make the you have to make the argument directly to the people. Otherwise, how would they know? If we at the council level and in, in my role as mayor and the and the alder people, if we don't hear you, how can we how can we honor what you want? We don't know. So it takes um, uh, certainly what I've learned is it it takes it, it takes everybody, you know the. Um, and when we make mistakes, uh, we hear about it, and or when we have a uh, when we have an opinion that's maybe not this person's, I'll always hear those. Um, it's not it's not uncommon when I'm going to get a gallon of milk at festival, and some butter. Uh, people will come right up to me, and and I appreciate that. And sometimes they'll say, you know, I really don't like this, and I'll take I'll listen to them because that's the first key thing. Listen. Um, and it's, this is very interesting. I've had people literally come up to me in restaurants um, and, and, and festival or pick and save or whatever, quite irritated on a decision that was made. And I'll, I want to hear their perspective. And then I go, I always ask him, is that your, your whole argument? That's, we're at, I certainly, I understand your opinion. And sometimes it gets to the point where I'll explain, you know, these are the other factors that maybe you weren't aware of. Sometimes we do that. And other times they're just so happy to have somebody listen to them. They're like, thank you. Thank you so much. You're doing a great job. Thank you for solving this issue that I just talked to you about. And I didn't solve it. I listened to them. They were heard. And I think that goes a long way in, in local government. So I'm hoping that more people will, you know, get out there and talk to us. I've come to uh, being on a board. I've understood now that how the OJ jury went, because you can only decide from the facts that were presented to you. And in the case of a trial like that, it was very cherry picked facts. And sometimes that happens not to accuse anybody of any kind of things, but sometimes omission is as powerful as inclusion into what they're telling you. What they didn't tell you was, or sometimes there's unintended consequences of decisions that are made that weren't considered at the time of a decision. But flying blind and then afterward finding out that, wow, I didn't get all the info here. I probably wouldn't have voted that way or felt that way had Correct. I known at the time is one of those things that until you've been there, as a person who's on the outside, you see it all. But when you're in the room and you only hear what you hear and make your decision from what you've been told, that's the way it goes sometimes. And people don't understand. Well, you didn't, I didn't know. You know, I didn't think that that would happen to you as a decision uh, of, that we made. 
for this reason, we made it this way. But never thinking that, you know, the backlash or the the other side of this was going to turn out that way. And that's why it's important for everybody to, at this level at least, participate as much as you can. Or a federal level, too, for that matter. There might just be a nugget in there that they can actually mine and use. Right. You know, I mean, you'll hear something on the Senate floor and say, hey, I put that in my letter. Right. Uh, You know, it was one of those things. Right. Um, Joining us, there he is, uh, Mike Warren. Good morning. (laughs) Good morning. Uh, Mayor, welcome back, first of all. Thank you. Um, Question here. um, Is the city doing anything um, in terms of the um, coronavirus? And the reason I ask is because this morning, the Eau Claire City County Health Department held a news conference to discuss how they are working with some local partners to prepare for any possible coronavirus cases in that area. And so all levels of government are now starting to prepare at various levels to get ready for some kind of uh, outbreak or a case or something should it pop up. Um, It's not just the federal and state governments anymore that are starting to talk about this. Local governments, county governments, municipal governments are starting to take this seriously. Uh, and for good reason. Uh, is Marshfield doing anything on that regard at all that that you're aware of? So it's a great question, and I have had that um, I have had that question a couple of times this week at the council meeting on two on Tuesday. I will mayor comments. I'll be making a full statement um, above it, but I'll give you the I'll give you the where I'm at right now. The uh, Marshfield Clinic Health System is is very ready uh, for this. They're putting out. Um, If you go to their website, they've got information on what they're going to do. And basically what we're looking at is um, right now I know that the one case that was in Wisconsin, they are now virus-free. I believe that it is going to – now let me give a disclaimer here. I'm not a physician. I don't claim to say anything about infectious diseases or anything like that. But um, they can spread a lot. It is is incredibly – akin to the flu from a symptomatic point of view. And the clinic has put out a post, and I think it's a very, very good. The number one thing that they need to do with patients coming in is identify if the person has the virus. And once they've identified that, then the next thing, of course, is to isolate that person. And the final thing, then, is to inform the public. Because once it actually gets here, um, if it gets here, then people need to to be informed. Now, the key issue, what can the general population do? There is a panic over this. And, um, you know, who's most at risk? Are the people that are elderly or medically at, at risk? Um, you look at the, I believe in Washington, there, have been, there, there was a big outbreak in a convalescent center. And I believe six or eight people from that center um, passed away. Now, that spread through there really, really quickly. Um, what, the, what the public can do is, um, you know, stuff that we, that we really know, wash your hands a lot. The way this, the way this spreads is, is through transmission, it can stay on things for up to nine hours, I understand. So wash your hands a lot. You see up at the clinic when you go in there, they've got the sanitizers there. And the biggest thing that we can do is if you are sick, stay home. Um, if your kids are sick and they're symptomatic, stay home. The way we fight this is the way we should really be fighting the flu um, because the flu has thousands of, of deaths every year. But, and the main thing that we can do as the public is to wash our hands a lot, sanitize them um, a lot. And then if you are sick, if you feel a fever, if you're not feeling well, um, if you start coughing or if you believe you're catching a cold, stay home. If your kids, and this is the big one, this one's hard on, on younger parents that have kids in school. Many times kids in school are sent to school sick, man, you're talking about spreading a, a something very, very quick. Now, I'm not saying that the 
coronaviruses here and that we're spreading that. But basically, what the clinic is ready for is uh, number one, to identify, and they call it the three eyes. Identify if this is there. Once they do, if they do diagnose that, then isolate that person. Find out from that person where they've been around, where they're traveling. Did this happen domestically or, or did they happen uh, while travel? And then number three. Uh, three is inform the public, um, and those are, are the main things. We there's uh, I spoke with the uh, police chief yesterday. They're ready. They've ordered more. Um, uh, they've ordered more masks. And in the, in for the mask use, as I was just traveling to, I went through Minneapolis and and then to LAX. There were more and more people there with masks, and a mask is good for the person that is infected, not to infect. Um, but the person that's not infected, is there really a value? Our medical folks are telling them um, not to use those because the, the medical people need them. Those things have gone from – masks have, have gone from $0.50 cents a mask, and now if you try to buy them, they're $2.50. So it's – you know, that's incredible. So th that's really where we are at right now. Um, we will be contacting the um, Wood County, um, Wood County Health to get their perspective uh, and everything. But the main thing people can do, number one, don't panic. Um, but be, be aware. Uh, maybe, maybe not shaking hands as much and, and things like that. But the basic things we have to do, wash your hands a lot. Uh, and if you're sick, stay home. Um, that's the big key thing. Those two ways are how these things go, you know, on, on how these things can really take off. So I believe that we are in control, meaning we, the citizens, we can really um, hope that it never, ever gets here to Marshfield. Um, uh, but, you know, hope is not a policy. There's there's um, we, we've got to we've got to make sure that we take care of it. So wash your hands. Stay home if you're sick. Yeah, uh, and unfortunately, people who shouldn't be buying masks or getting masks are. And we heard from like a drywaller, a drywall contractor who needs masks for his everyday line of work and couldn't get them because people were, you know, uh, unnecessarily panicking or buying masks for whatever reason. And now he can't get them for something he has to do every single day, coronavirus or no coronavirus. So that's another problem that is being caused by this fear uh, that is going on out there. The other thing I was going to ask, I don't know, maybe you know anything about this as far as the president signing off on the $8.3 billion allocated by Congress to help fight coronavirus. $8.3 billion is the uh, package. And uh, does that go, where does that go? Because I know it said, we had the report, the state health department said they got the million bucks from the feds. How does that go to uh, directly to health organizations? Does it go to county or city governments, or do you know how that money sort of trickles down to the local level once the state gets it from the federal government? Well, if you see, if, if we got a, a million dollars, that'll trickle down through the uh, through the counties. You know, obviously, the bigger counties with more population are probably going to get more of a share. How much is going to trickle down to us? In uh, Marshfield, I'm not really that optimistic um, about that. That amount of money sounds like a lot of money, but when you look at um, uh, when you when you look at that for the whole country, it's not that much. But what it does is it sends a signal, and this is the big key thing. We've seen the stock market go um, really crazy over the last. Um, week maybe uh 10 days over this and so what what the stock market and everything reacts to is unsettledness and anxiety and so what this is going to do when they see the federal government um making this investment if you will that eases the anxiety because my big concern is for people that are um that are at risk or that do have um, anxiety to deal with, this stresses them out. And so this is like a little relief. Um, if you remember, the, the president went on and made a statement that, well, 
it, it really didn't go over so well. The stock market reacted quite negatively. Then he went on with his the physicians and the scientists that were there and made another statement, and the market corrected itself uh, just a little bit. My guess would be that by showing this eight point three billion, people are going to believe that that is going to be helpful, and there will be less anxiety with that. But it still gets down to Mike. The basic thing is the people are the ones that are in control. We, I, I, now this, if it's here and somebody's infected, that, uh, which that is not the case here in Marshfield. But the way we can really help control that from happening here, wash your hands, and if you are sick, stay home. Even if you don't think that it could happen to you, um, stay home. And that is hard. That's hard advice for people with kids in third and fourth grade, and they got to get to work. They got to pay the bills, and well, it's just a little sniffle. Right. Um, you know what I mean? Their temperature's only 100. Right. Um, but and keep, now, them, keep yeah. them home. And now that I think about it, the money would probably go, since there is no city health department per se, it would probably go to like the county, the county. health department, and then the county would you know, implement their their plan from there on a county-wide basis. So that's probably how it's being done. How they decide how much each county gets is uh, beyond me. I'm not sure how they do that, but I don't know. A million divided by 72, and that's how they do it? I, I don't know. I'm guessing it's based on population or something. but It is, and when you, when you look at how that million will trickle down, the, the, the benefit of, of it, to people, I don't know how much that is really there. I will tell you that when the president and vice president and the, and the scientists say that they're showing that they're taking it seriously, that does a lot to ease fears. That does a lot to um, decrease anxiety, and I think that's the overall much bigger, much bigger effect. But I will tell you this. In Marshfield, I'm very confident in the Marshfield Clinic Health Systems how they are how they are prepared for this they are and and that's where people would go um and they they are well prepared i have a hundred percent confidence in them i have a hundred percent confidence in our our emergency services um because they'll be out with people that are sick they're you know they, and they've got to have gloves on um which they still go out and they do uh, do anyway so prevention is always the best medicine um, that we possibly can, and we're just going to have to get through this. We've been through this type of thing before with SARS and and all the different types of flus, flus that are that were there. Um, but again, if you look at this, I'm not discounting the coronavirus. It's a real thing. People have to be careful. But if you look so far, there are so many more people that are dying from the basic flu, and some of them actually go out and, and you know they can they can. Some of them even get the flu shot, but it's if it's not the right strain, then you really run into a problem. With all of them, no matter what it is, the coronavirus, the flu, the cold, what? how do we as the public address all of them equally? Wash our hands, and if you are sick, stay home. What you just recently went to the West Coast? Mm -hmm. What did a did you have any qualms about going where people did test positive and did die from coronavirus? And b what were those conversations like out there? Uh, well, it was very interesting. Uh, that's a great point because when we were in Minneapolis, there were a lot of people with masks, and I don't believe that anyone in. But they get a lot of international flights, as does LAX. Um, and there, I sensed. And this isn't a study. I sensed more anxiety over this in the cities than when you get out to uh, when you get out to California. Now there were a lot of masks at. Um, I'd say that there. What I saw, my wife and I, what we saw is there were more masks in in um, the, at Minneapolis than there was at LAX. There were some at LAX, but when I got out into the general population, um, then it was, you really didn't see many masks at all, and people are not really affected by it as much. Uh, as an example, uh, we went out there to, uh, my wife had a convention uh, that we were going to that happened to be 
and the hotel was directly next to the Staples Center. And um, we were down there, and they were on the they were having this big convention in this hotel. Plus, at the Staples Center on that Sunday, there was a, a Laker game from twelve thirty to three thirty, and then they get every they rush everybody out, and then there was a Kings game from seven to ten, which I was impressed with. Okay, they they took away the basketball court and they put the ice cubes in there for the for ice hockey rink or in three hours. It was amazing. There was literally thousands of people around there, and there was really no anxiety about it. It, it, it wasn't palpable, I guess, if you would. So, I, you know, I don't know what the deal is uh, there. I have no idea. I'm, I'm very hopeful. I'm keeping my fingers crossed um, that it does not come here to Marshfield, but it very well could. And um, we've got to be we've got to be hopeful, but be diligently prepared. And I believe we are. Interesting uh, story or comments. So yeah, appreciate that. That's all I've got. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. Mike Warren joining us here and on the Insight Program. Yeah, and hopefully he only brought T-shirts back as souvenirs <laughs> and not coronavirus. That's right. Good lord. I will. I'll tell you. I almost want. It was so great because I got to spend time with my grandson. And uh, oh wow. And we went out at the very end of the pier, and there was this seagull there, and he wouldn't move. So we took a picture with the seagull, and I just thought, only in California. Oh, you know, the the seagulls awesome. are the seagulls are so laid back that they take photos. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, those California seagulls. Hey, man. <laughs> <You know. laughs> hey, bro. You know, whatever. By the way, the just a, a public, um, I don't know, what do you call it? Um, uh, you know, uh, just to kind of pass this along. All the sirens uh, before? Yes. Uh, if people were wondering, down Central Avenue, <laughs> that was the fire trucks and the police vehicles escorting the uh, Marshfield High School gymnastics team uh, out of town on their way to the state tournament. All right. So that's what that was about. You know, we really have here <laughs> in Marshfield some really talented high school athletes. and The gymnastics team. The, the the track team, the bowlers. I mean, yeah. and and the and the science folks. I mean, it's really incredible. Yeah, gymnastics team really got better after I left, quit the team. <laughs> so thanks, Mayor. <laughs> All right. The Inside Program here for this first Friday in March. You know that if you're listening live. Otherwise, you could be watching us in. Uh, Video at Marshfield Media Access, either on their web page, Facebook page, or uh, on channel 989 from your Spectrum Digital tier. Again, thank you for stopping by. And thank you. Not a lot happening on the agenda this time of the year, so we talk about things in general, I guess. Yep. But you're here to answer whatever people bring in on AM 1450 WDLB's Insight Program. I'm Jeff Cannon.